Welcome back to Bombastic Nation and Ting and Ting and Ting. I'm Mr. Jan, and I got some more vibes for all you. Okay, a while back I started this series, uh, Simon Bolivar, uh, and uh, you know, lackluster interest in it, but I want to watch it. This one is for me, you know, because we learned about Simon Bolivar back in school at home and thing like that. So, you know, I just want to refresh myself, read up on it. And I'm telling you, this is a very interesting man here. So, you yeah, know, this, uh, this is the second episode of it. It's called Simon Boulevard, uh, Francisco de Miranda. And, uh, of course, this is extra history again, giving it to us. I tell you, check them out. They got some good stuff. They tell you the history about people that you don't even know existed and the great things they've done and the bad things they've done and, and the good things they've done. You know what I mean? So go check them out. Let's go ahead and YouTube and Sim Simmer and learn some more about Simon Bolivar. Last we left off, Simon had returned to Caracas. But even as he returned oh, Simon to the city, Bolivar, he sorry. a new ardor for revolution and beginning to think about how to make it a reality, events were afoot in Europe. Napoleon, that great wild card, the great overthrower of tradition, had invaded Spain. <laughs> armies, once the allies of Spain came tearing into the Iberian Peninsula. The king abdicated. His son was forced to put aside the crown. Napoleon declared his own brother the king of Spain. The court was in confusion. The army was in disarray. Central authority had broken down. Small juntas began to crop up everywhere, claiming rightful of... So, when that happened at that time, I wonder if France recognized all of the Spanish colonies like in South America and stuff as their own. Now, how long did the 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 reign over Spain continue and how come they didn't take advantage of, you know, the colonies that had such riches at the time for them, you know, economically speaking? Huh. Of course they had Haiti and stuff like that and that that you know I guess they didn't want to deal with all of that. Of course, he was dealing with several wars on several fronts, but then he would have had South America as part of his uh, colonized, if you will, area. Uh, that's an interesting take on the vibe there. Let's, let's continue here. Let's continue. Small juntas began to crop up everywhere, claiming rightful authority in Spain. But even the most legitimate of these contenders was stuck in a besieged city. So that's why he couldn't do anything, because he had those guerrillas when so we watched the, the Napoleon thing. Were they now the subjects of Napoleon's brother? Or were they to submit to the will of the walled-off junta bottled up in Cadiz? Who knew? These questions might not have been the ones foremost in the minds of Europe at the time, but in Caracas, they burned through the streets. After much debate, they found a third option. They would create their own junta and declare it in support of Ferdinand VII, the king who Napoleon had deposed. But since the king was pretty much out of the picture and they recognized no other continental authority, this basically meant they were now independent. With that sorted, they then sent the representatives of the central junta of Spain packing and began self-governance under a council of the leading men of Venezuela. Simon was not to be found among these leading men. To them, Simon was just a youth. He was reckless, rude, a bit dissolute, and yeah, he'd returned recently from Europe with a fire in his belly, but they all figured it was just a matter of time before that fire burned out. He was a liability. But they were broke. They wanted to send a delegation to England, but as a newly established government and with the Napoleonic Wars wreaking havoc on trade, they just didn't have the money to do it. But Bolivar, that kid was rich, like, really rich. And with all the impetuousness and the arrogance that they'd come to expect of him, Bolivar offered to pay for the whole trip if they would let him... Man, come. he Even had bank. this generous offer, some of the council were worried about the idea of Bolivar being one of their official representatives to England. In the end, though, money won, and they figured, well... It always does, apparently. ...worse a position than we're in now, so why not? Of course, just to be safe, they sent him with two other older and more respected members of the community. They figured, let Bolivar spend the money, have those guys actually do the work. So Bolivar departed for England, looking to secure recognition and aid for his fledgling nation. Upon arrival, they quickly arranged a private visit with England's foreign minister. They gather at his stately mansion on the edge of Hyde Park and begin the meeting. They speak in French because Bolivar, though he was acting as an emissary to England, doesn't know a word of English. 
The foreign minister takes the lead, stating bluntly, or at least so French. Saying, that he needs to know whether Venezuela is seeking total independence or if it's still loyal to the deposed king of Spain. You see, he's trying to signal to them that the Spanish are fighting Napoleon and therefore are now England's allies, which is something he can't jeopardize. So, boldly, Politics. this to be his moment to shine, that he will be the one to convince the English to enter in their cause, Bolivar steps forward before either of the others can respond, and speaks at length, with elegance and passion, about the struggle that has gone into throwing off the mother country's yoke, and the desire of the people to be truly free. Clearly, he didn't get the hint. So, the foreign minister quietly sighs and figures, okay, I'll try again. This time he states, in a way that he finds too straightforward to really even be civil, that England is Spain's ally, so they need to tell him, wink wink, that they aren't planning to totally break from the Spanish crown. One of the others tried to step in and respond, but Bolivar was filled with passion. He knew this was his moment. He had this. He doubled down, offering his most soaring and powerful rhetoric, a cry so passionate that it must move even this stone-faced Englishman. And then, at the height of the performance, in a flash of inspiration, the type of monumental genius only he was capable of, he handed the English minister the letters of introduction and the packet of credentials that he'd been given by the government back home, so that the minister may see his people's commitment and passion in their own words. He continued in his most stunning, gripping rhetoric as the minister leafed through the letters from his people. And then he brought it home. The ending was perfect. There is no way that the minister could not see the righteousness of their cause now. The minister was quiet. Clearly, he'd been stunned to silence by Bolivar's moving words. When he'd recovered himself enough to move, he slowly lifted a single piece of paper out of the packet and handed it across the table. In his passion, Bolivar had accidentally handed the minister all the letters from his people, including the instructions that he'd received from his government. And in those instructions was a note that basically read in bold letters, absolutely do not mention the idea of Venezuelan independence. We are not doing that. We are loyal to the king. We are in no way going to try to break our <laughs> own Do not imply that we are. Before Bolivar's jaw could hit the floor or his face could turn tomato red, the minister landed the one-two punch, sliding Simon's passport across the desk, tapping it with one finger, and saying, My Spanish is poor, but isn't the nation you hail from literally called the Supreme Junta of Caracas, dedicated to preserving the rights of King Ferdinand VII? But then, the stone-faced Englishman laughed and said that he admired Bolivar's zeal. Still, needless to say, none of the Junta's goals were met. No concrete deal on trade or formal recognition were forthcoming. Wow. There was another man who Bolivar met in London. A man named Francisco de Miranda. The one man in all of London whom the delegates were instructed to not meet. Miranda was perhaps the oldest Venezuelan freedom fighter. He was now 60, and for decades he'd been agitating for South and Central American freedom from Spain. He even once launched a catastrophically inept attempt to liberate Venezuela by force back in 1804. And he had dreams like Bolivar had dreams. Not of some mere republic that paid lip service to a monarch back in Spain, but true and complete independence. See, it's like these countries have been fighting for some sort of freedom at some point in history and well i guess every country has but i'm from that region it's just crazy i mean you know 1804 that was around the same time as the uh as the haitian revolution i guess that it was a time of uh freedom fighting kind of like the 80s it's like it's repeating but uh Wow, that's somebody I've never heard of before, though. So, I'm glad I, I watched this because I never heard of this uh, Miranda guy. Cool, I'm going to have to look him up. A republic that paid lip service to a monarch back in Spain, but true and complete independence for his native land. He was now residing in London because after his bungled attempt to take over his country by force, he had taken refuge with the English. His house had become a meeting place for Latin Americans in London. There, Bolivar not only met much of the upper echelons of British and expat society, but he also became fast friends with Miranda himself. Soon, he convinced Miranda that he needed to return to Venezuela, that the people were waiting for him to reignite the fires of revolution. But when they did both return to Venezuela, Miranda was not greeted by a cheering crowd waiting to bestow on him the command of a newly formed republic, but rather a small group of onlookers who, for lack of anything better to do, boredly watched him get off the ship. 
Slightly miffed but undeterred, they soon threw themselves into politics, suborning a small political party called Patriotic, Patriotic Society, Society and using it as a platform to run the type of political campaigns that had become a staple of London but had never been seen in the southern half of the New World. They made inroads with the mixed-race peoples who had been largely ignored by the junta of rich whites. There was some ego clashing between Bolivar and Miranda, but soon all of that was overshadowed by two great events. First, a member of the newly formed Congress turned out to be a spy for the Spanish Regency and had fled in the night with important papers of state. This incident caused an uproar. Why defend the Spanish government if they were spying on and thieving from Venezuela? But this incident might have blown over if it weren't for the second piece of news that followed swiftly on its heels. Wellington had defeated another of Napoleon's armies in Spain. The Spanish government would soon truly return. This became a pivot point, one of those seminal moments in history where a decision has to be made, and make it the Venezuelans did. They finally declared themselves truly and fully independent. But this independence was an independence by rich whites for rich whites, and as soon as word of the inequities in its constitution spread, slave rebellions and counter-revolution spread with it. Before long, the inexperienced and inept forces of the Republic were routed, and they turned to the only experienced soldier among them, Miranda, to lead their forces. He did so on one condition, that Bolivar be stripped of his rank and not allowed to participate. What? This was totally unexpected, to Bolivar and to the ruling council. Bolivar exploded in rage, but there was little he could do, until a sympathetic general brought him onto his staff as an adjunct. Here he served with distinction, proving his valor and value on the battlefield, so much so that Miranda allowed him to bring news of their successes back to Caracas, commending him and recommending that his rank be restored. But always in the background, in private, he said that Bolivar fought like a guerrilla, undisciplined, with little of the strictures of military life or command. But he went in! Things soon took a turn for the worse. Spanish officers arrived on the scene and began raising and training an army of the discontent. Then an even greater tragedy struck. An earthquake of unimagined magnitude struck Caracas. Tens of thousands of people died. The financial, cultural, and political capital of the new nation was reduced to ruins. The people thought it was the punishment of God. Troops began to desert, and Bolivar, who was sent to garrison a stronghold, ended up getting fired upon by the very troops that were supposed to be guarding the fort he was to protect. And through this, Miranda waged an anemic campaign, always on the retreat. Until, in a shock to everybody, he offered a unilateral surrender. He did not consult Congress, he didn't speak to Bolivar. He made the terms with the Spanish as if he were Venezuela's king. Bolivar sensed treason, could only think of it as a betrayal, and betrayal was to be met with betrayal. On the night before Miranda was to slip away, allowing himself passage on a ship while he had locked down the ports to all the other Venezuelans, Bolivar and a group of his friends seized Miranda and turned him over to the local constable, who soon turned him over to the Spanish. Miranda would die in a prison a few years later, tossed into a mass grave like a common criminal. But Bolivar, in the chaos, somehow managed to slip away before the arrival of the Spanish forces. His family connections kept him safe, and he plotted his next move in a fight he considered far from finished. The fight for Venezuelan independence. Wow. Ah, hey, I am looking forward to the rest of this. This this is uh, way more uh, captivating than I thought it would be. So, yeah. I'm looking forward for that. You know what I mean? For those of you who know, comment down below and tell me what you think of this and, uh, you know, all of that. Uh, thank you guys for watching this with me, man. Thank you guys for watching this with me as usual. Link in the description for this video. Check out Extra History. They got some cool stuff. They got a lot of these uh, series on the historical figures and thing, you know, and uh, countries and stuff like that. Great stuff, man. Great stuff. In the meantime, y'all take care of each other, all right? Cool runnings.